بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله منج الخلق من عدم ثم الصلاة وعلى المختار في القدم مولاي الصلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم الحمد لله this is our fourth lesson from Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi rahmatullahi alayhi book al-Wasiyya the first lesson was an introduction in the second lesson we learned about hastening to act doing good deeds as much as we can as fast as we can building up you know, uh, as many deeds as we can get in our accounts and burning our bank balance, if you like, for the hereafter. And in the previous week's session, we learned about protecting the good we have done. So doing good, then protecting them. Do not invalidating our good deeds with bad or with doing anything wrong. In today's wasiyah, today is the final wasiyah, but I'm going to split this final wasiyah up into a couple of sessions, maybe more, inshallah. <coughs> So he basically says that, look, to get the pleasure of Allah, there is a double-sided coin. <coughs> on one side of the coin, there is doing good deeds. And on the other side of the coin, there is staying away from evil. So one is doing good, and the other is not doing evil. Because if a person only does good, but then he continues to do evil as well. Then the good and the evil will balance out and he'll end up being nowhere anyway. And if the person didn't do any good deeds, but only stayed away from sin, then that itself is a sin, staying away from good. So again, the person will go nowhere. So for a person to move forward in his relationship and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he needs to number one, do good, protect the good, and then stay away from evil because the evil will come and the evil will cut holes in his good deeds. And the evil will destroy all the good deeds he has accumulated. And the way we stay away from evil, the way we stay away from the things Allah has said, no, do not do this, is by building taqwa inside our hearts. Building fear of Allah inside our hearts. A vigilance, consciousness. Allah is here, Allah is watching me, Allah is looking at me. Everything I do, Allah sees me. Everything I say, Allah hears. Everywhere I look, Allah can see where I'm looking. Every feeling I have, Allah knows what I feel. <coughs> Knowing that Allah is here, Allah is present. Ibn Qudama rahmatullahi alayhi, he writes, Tell yourself, if one of my community's right-acting men, one of the good men of my community, if they were to see me, then I would be too ashamed and embarrassed to do this deed. Think for ourselves, if my father were to see me like this, would I continue to do it? If I would stop because my father saw me, then surely I should stop because I know Allah is always looking at me. I, I mentioned the story a few days ago when we had the talk after Isha that a man seduced a woman and he took the woman out into the fields. And he said, look, now it's you and I and there's nobody with us. We are alone. We are completely alone. Nobody can see us. And he looked up to the stars and he said, Look, nobody can see us except the stars. And then she replies to him, Okay, you say only the stars can see us. What about the ones who makes the stars run? What about him? Can he see us? So even though we think nobody is looking, in reality Allah is looking and Allah is always looking. And we should say to ourselves, furthermore, I am not safe that he will hasten my punishment and he, is, he will remove the veil that conceals all of my wrongdoing. This enough should be, this should be enough or sufficient for us to keep us away from haram. Knowing that, okay, I'll do haram and inshallah Allah might forgive me. But what if people were to find out? Allah has veiled me and hidden my sins. What if tomorrow Allah opens it up to the people and they find out what I'm doing? <coughs> and it happens. We think we do things in private. We think we do things in private. And because of the world of social media and everybody knows everybody and every, you know the world is a small village, somehow people have found out by tomorrow the thing the sin I thought was secret was private, tomorrow becomes public. This enough this is enough of a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are disgraced in our communities. Know that you can only disobey Allah by means of his blessing. Meaning? If we use our eyes in the wrong way and we look at who is haram for us, who gave us the eyes? Allah. 
So we are disobeying Allah with the same blessing He gave to us. If we listen to things which are haram, He gave us our ears. Allah, He gave us the ability to listen. There are many people in the world who can't hear. There are many people in the world who are deaf. Allah gave us the capacity and the ability in our faculties to listen. So I am using Allah's blessings to disobey Him. When we walk somewhere which is haram, to a venue of haram, He gave us our feet. He gave us the ability to walk. Allah. So we are disobeying Allah using His own blessings. One of the pious people used to say, Oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness for any wrong action which my body was strong enough to commit because of the health you gave to me. You gave me health, alhamdulillah, but you, I used it to sin. Which my hands were able to obtain by the virtue of your blessing. You gave me my hands and the ability to touch, to feel, to do things with my hands. And I've used the same blessing against you. In which I was delighted by your ample provision and in which I am veiled from people by your veil. Your forbearance and patience emboldened me to do it. Meaning, Allah, I had hoped that you would forgive me, you would be forbearant and you wouldn't punish me straight away. And in it I have put my trust in the generosity of your pardon. Now that I've done it, Allah, I just wish that you are generous enough to pardon me, to forgive me. A man came to Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi. Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi was a student of the people like Hubayr bin Iyad rahmatullahi alayhi, a student of the likes of Sufyan Thawli rahmatullahi alayhi, a great, great alim. He passed away in the second century. And a person comes to him. I've mentioned this in one of my talks before. And he said, Oh Ibrahim, I can't stop committing sins. And I want permission to commit sins. I just can't help myself. Ibrahim replies to him that, okay, if you have five qualities inside of you, I'll give you permission to commit as many sins as you like. So the person said, okay, what are these five qualities? He said, you need to have these five qualities, five characteristics, adopt them, all of them, and then you can do what you like. The person says, okay, what are the Ibrahim? Ibrahim replies, number one, when you want to disobey Allah, do not eat from the food He provides you. Because that's not fair. You can't, you know, what do they call it? You can't bite, you can't bite the hand that gives you to food, you know, that, that, that feeds you. So how can you disobey the one whose food you eat? So if you want to disobey Him, no problem, stop eating. When you can do this, do, like, do as you like. And the person said, of course I can't do this. We are all dependent on food and drink to survive. Without food and drink, we can't survive. Then Ibrahim said to him, okay, then do you think it's proper that you eat his food and you still disobey him? He said, no. What's the second quality? The second quality, he said, was if you want to disobey him, do not give him his land. Sometimes, parents might say to their children that if you want to do this, get out of my house. You can't do this inside my house. So if you want to do this inside Allah's land, if you want to disobey him, then don't do it inside Allah's land. The person replied, but Ibrahim, you know, Allah owns the seven heavens and the seven earths. Where do I go? Where do everything? He owns everything. His land is everywhere. Where do I go then? And then Ibrahim said to him, Okay, then so do you think it's proper and it's fair that you live in his land and you disobey him? The person said, No. He said, Okay, what's the third quality? And he said, If you want to disobey him, at least do it somewhere where he can't see you. I know, you know, like nowadays we have people, I, I don't know, maybe now it's got a lot worse, but when maybe about 10, 15 years ago when we had. Even uncles and cousins who used to smoke, they used to smoke in front of their parents. They, their parents knew they smoked. Father, father and mother knew that this person smoked, but they also always go away and smoke in their absence, never smoke in their presence, even though everybody knows they do it and they come in and they smell. But this is similar. So Ibrahim says, if you want to disobey Allah, fine, disobey him, but do it where he can't see you. And the person said, but you know, Allah is the of Ali was shahada, Allah sees whatever is hidden, whatever is open. Allah can see everything, private and public, so where am I going to go? Where am I going to go where Allah can't see me? So Ibrahim replies, so do you think it's proper that Allah is looking at you and you're sitting in front of Him? And the person said, no. He said, okay, what's the third quality and fourth quality I need to implement? And then he said, okay, fourth quality is when the angel of death comes to you. Then you tell the angel of death that, wait, wait for a minute. Let me do tawbah, let me do istighfar, let me change my actions and seek forgiveness from Allah, and then you can take me. 
And the person said, but in the Quran, Allah says that, look, when a, time, when a person's time comes, it comes. You can't delay it, you can't bring it forward, nothing can happen. Whenever Allah decides, it is my time, it is my time. So he says, you have no control over when you can repent, when you can't repent. So is it proper that you commit sins and you disobey Allah, not knowing that you may be or may not be able to repent? The person said, of course not. And then the person asked, tell me the fifth quality I need to have. Ibrahim rahmatullahi alayhi said, when the Zabaniya come to you to take you to the fire, Zabaniya are the angels who will drag you to the fire. When they come to you and they take you to the fire, then say, no, I don't want to go. And refuse the angel's command to go to the fire. The person obviously said that, you know, I'll, I'll resist as much as I want, but they won't be able to, you know, they won't listen to me. Of course they take me. I won't be able to resist them. And then Ibrahim said that if you can't defend yourself from entry into the hellfire, then how can you disobey Allah? Is it then proper to disobey Allah knowing that you have no control about whether you enter hellfire or not? And the person said, this, is, this advice is enough for me. He then stayed in the khidmah and in the company of Sayyidina Ibrahim rahmatullahi alayhi and he worshipped Allah until he passed away. These five things Ibrahim rahmatullahi alayhi said are enough. If a person wanted to take heed today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who take heed and who take lessons. These five advices or reminders of Ibrahim rahmatullahi alayhi are enough for a person who wants to repent, to stay away from sin, to think. The problem we have is I don't think, let's be honest, right? We all commit sins. But when we commit sins, we don't actively commit sins knowing that yes, I am disobeying Allah. I don't think anybody commits a sin knowing, like, you know, being jari, being courageous, and being like, looking, you know, oh Allah, look, look, haha, I'm committing a sin. We don't, nobody, no Muslim, no Mu'min has the courage to commit a sin like that. When we commit sins, unfortunately, we do it because we're switched off. We switch off, right? We don't do it knowingly, we don't do it actively. We, do, we just become passive, and in our subconscious and our unconscious, we just forget that Allah is with you. <coughs> So uh, Hafid ibn Qudama rahmatullahi alayhi is trying to wake us up and say, no, wake up, wake up. If you want to commit a sin, think, how am I committing a sin? We commit sins in many different ways. With your eyes, think, who gave you your eyes? What if Allah made you blind tomorrow? How, are you, how am I going to respond to Allah? I walk into a place of evil, what if Allah took my ability to walk away? What if I have an accident, Allah save us, protect us? What if, what if I have an accident and I become disabled tomorrow? What's going to happen to me? How can we disobey Allah with what Allah has given us? One of the people used to say, and this is a, become like a Twitter and Instagram meme, and I'll tell you where it comes from. Ibn, Ibn Mubarak, Abdullah bin Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi, was a great alim of the past. He was so great that in all of the ulama of the past, when the people after them have spoken of them, they've always critiqued or criticized them for something. And there's only a few men in the whole history of Islam, after the Sahaba, who have stayed away from any criticism. From them is Abdullah bin Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi. Where they look at him, look at his life, look at his story, and think this man had no, had no bad qualities for us to criticize. <coughs> He's written a book called Kitab al Zuhd. In Kitab al Zuhd, Zuhd means like to stay away from the dunya, to detach yourself from the dunya, ascet, um, to, be, uh, to be an ascetic, like a Sufi, to stay away from the dunya, leave the dunya. In his Kitab al Zuhd, he's written a statement from a Shaykh, Bilal bin Sa'id, rahmatullahi alayhi. And the statement goes, do not look at the smallness of the sin. Do not look at the smallness of the sin you are committing, but look at the magnitude of the one you are disobeying. Don't think, oh, this is only a little sin, it's nothing. Look at who you're disobeying. Look at who the sin is against. Allah, who is greater than the greatest, right? So don't look at the sin. Otherwise, if you keep looking at the small sins, you'll continue to build them up, and our small pebbles will become into, come into mountains. Don't look at the smallness of the sin. Look at the greatness of the one you're standing in front of. And I'll finish with one story. One of the governors, Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi, is known as Khalifat al-Khamis or Umar al-Thani, the second Umar. Because after the four Khalifs passed away, then Sayyidina Hassan bin Ali rahmatullahi alayhi, the grandson of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa had the khilaf about six months. 
Then Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala and was Khalifa, then Yazid bin Muawiyah and the problems ensued. And then Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi became the Amir al Mu'mineen of the Muslimin. He became the Amir al Mu'mineen at the end of the century. And people used to call him the second Umar because the qualities that the first Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu had, Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz also had. So a governor, so he's the Amir and he has governors in different areas, right? So one of the governors wrote to him and said, he was complaining. So Sayyidina Umar rahmatullahi replied to him and he said, my brother, remember that the people of the fire will be sleepless in the fire for all of eternity. They're always going to be awake and feel it. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullama aradu an yakhruju minha, u'idu fiha. Whenever they will want to leave the fire, u'idu fiha, they will be thrown back into it. Wa'ila lahum, dhuqu adab al harik. They will be told, dhuqu, feel, taste, adab al harik, the burning, the blazing adab, punishment. So the people in the fire for eternity will be awake. If their skin will burn, the skin will be replaced. Allah save and protect us. Beware that the one who will take you away from the presence of Allah will do so to the fire so that it is the last command and it cuts off hope. Meaning when the angels take you away from Allah and they take you to the fire, this is going to be, this is it now. Finished. There's no time for tawbah. No time for repentance. Illa ma sha Allah. Except for the exceptions Allah, only Allah knows about. But we can't live to be exceptions because we have no idea. You can't live with that risk. After Allah says, go to the fire, that's it. All hope is finished. The man reads the letter. And then he travels to Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar says, what has brought you here? He replies, I have resigned my heart because of your letter. I will not work as a governor for you or anybody after you. Because if you are the governor of a place, you are the leader of a place, you are responsible for every single living being in that vicinity, in that area. Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz very famously he used to say that I am fearful Allah will ask me about the bird that goes hungry in my kingdom. This is the fear they had about the, you know, the sultanate, the kingdom that they used to. They, that they used to rule over. So this person said, I no longer wish to be a governor. Who's going to take that responsibility over people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us all to stay. I know it's, it's very, very difficult. It's the hardest thing. And this statement always stays in my mind, and I'll repeat it to you. That our Shaykh once told us that any, any person, good or bad, any person can do a good deed. But only a pious person can stay away from sin. Any person can do a good deed, but only pious people stay away from sin. So if we want ourselves to become amongst the pious, we need to stay away from sin. And it is insanely difficult. It is probably more difficult now than it has ever been in the history of the dunya. You know why? Because we have accessibility to sins today is easier than ever before. There was a time only 20 years ago, maybe when I was a child, about 15, 20 years ago, where if a child is in his room on his own, you know that is the safest place for him. But it's completely switched, where 15 years later, if a child is in the room on his own, that is probably the worst place for him to be. Because sins have become so easy. As sins become easy, it becomes more difficult. As staying away from sins becomes more difficult, the reward is always greater. This is a principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something like, the, the, there's a principle in Arabic, I forgot what it is, maybe al-ajru bi qadr al jahdi or something like that. That the ajr, the reward you get, is according to the effort that you have to put in. If you make wudu at fajr time with cold water in the winter, your reward is obviously greater than the person who's sitting in luxurious warm water. Of course, doing it with colder water is more difficult, it requires more discipline, so the reward is naturally greater. In the same way, sins today are easier to commit. And Allah knows they're easier to commit. So if we stay away from sins today, let's start somewhere. It's very difficult for us to go home, right? Maybe you're feeling a bit impassioned. But it's very difficult to go home and, you know, break all the haram things that we're doing, haram or the things like that, and change our habits over and it's pretty much impossible. So what we do is, you now this is practical advice, pick one sin, just one, big or small, or the bigger the better, that means we get one major sin out of our lives. 
the bigger the better take one sin from our life and make a promise if we're doing it a lot then cut down the dosage if it's something we can leave overnight then leave it overnight only one if you try to do too much we're going to fail it's it, it's going to happen okay if you try to do everything finish everything it's too difficult let's be human let's be realistic okay if i'm on a high dosage of a sin like for example I don't know, I have a sin where I'm watching things I'm not meant to and I do it five times a week. Cut it down to maybe once a week. Cut it down, cut it down, cut it down, cut it, and then stop. If you can stop overnight, perfect. If you can't, which most people can't do it immediately, then cut it down. And then come to a point where you can stop. These are very practical advices on how we can pick one sin, one sin, and try at least once a week, one sin, one sin cut from our life. If not once a month, cut one sin from my life. That I will never commit this sin again, inshallah. If I do, it's a circle. Taqwa and Tawbah. You know, like a bike has two wheels, it can't work with one. It's like saying Taqwa and Tawbah. Taqwa means I stay away from sin as much as I can. I fear Allah, I fear the fire of Jahannam. How can I displease Allah when He's looking at me? But if I make a mistake in our subconscious, unconscious, we forget about Allah, we make a mistake, okay, fine, no problem. Now do Tawbah. Repent immediately. I make the sin again, don't, don't worry about it. Repent again. I do it again, don't worry, repent again. And taqwa and tawbah, these two wheels go in motion together. They work together, work together. And inshallah, if our heart is sincere, Allah will change our hearts. Inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us with ikhlas, enable a soul to stay away from sins and to gain his pleasure. Ameen wa rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Subhanahu wa bihamdi.